a huge pleasure to introduce my friend and professional wine judge, Cameron Jones. So Cameron, after a corporate career living in London, Sydney, Mumbai, Singapore, where you developed your love for Asian food pairing, you moved to Santa Mur in uh, Beaujolais five years ago, went through it like a race, passed the WSET diploma, Cordon Bleu exams, qualified as WSET educator. Um, Cameron's going to share with us today the huge impact that terroir and in particular soils have on the different styles of the Beaujolais cru and how this broad range makes the wine so versatile for every occasion and food type. Consumer perception of Beaujolais is a massive hurdle to overcome, but this also means that the cru wines are hidden good value gems for the time being, especially when compared to some of the well-known Burgundy wines. Um, questions welcome, but as usual, please could you put them on the chat so that Cameron can answer them all at the end of his presentation. Thank you, Cameron. Great, Thank Thank you very, thanks very much, Sue, and thanks to the circle for uh, for having me on board. I've uh, I've enjoyed listening to uh, to many of the the previous presenters, and uh, I'm quite honoured to be uh, to be asked to present today. So, uh, without further ado, I think let's uh, let's get started. Okay, so we're talking about understanding the crews of the Beaujolais. So, um, yes, as Sue said, I've lived here for the last few years. Uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about the region. I think there's there's some fantastic wines, and I think you know it, it's something that I've very much enjoyed. Uh, you know, learning a lot more about it and, and really sort of deep diving into it. So, I'm excited to sort of take everyone on uh, on the journey with uh, with me tonight. So. Without further ado, what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to move through uh, and just give a little bit of background on the region so that everyone understands it a little bit better. Um, and then what I'll do after that is uh, is then go through the individual crews, which a lot of this story really is about uh, about tonight. So, uh, and then I'm hopefully we'll have about 15 minutes for question time at the end. Um, and then, of course, yes, if everyone can just put their uh, questions in the in the chat, we'll attempt to try to. Uh, uh, to get to them by the end. So for those who are sort of relatively new to the overall Beaujolais region, um, you can see where it sits in, uh, in you know, in the sort of the south uh, southeast part of, uh, or middle sort of eastern part of France. We've got about 13,000 hectares. Back in 40, 50 years ago, there was something like 22, 23,000 hectares. So there's been a lot of sort of modification and affirmative vine pulling. Um, and a real focus on uh, trying to improve the quality of the region. There is obviously, therefore, potential for, for further plantings. If we look at the production, 2021 was obviously a pretty difficult year here and also in uh, in Burgundy. Um, so only about 40, 485,000 hectolitres, but average is sort of 600 to sort of 630, 640,000 hectolitres per year. So there's some pretty big production comes out of it. But as you can see, if you follow my pointer, there's this big section of the Beaujolais down the bottom, which is all village and 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 Beaujolais that goes into mostly Nouveau, um, that really dominates a lot of the uh, a lot of the size. So if we talk about the the people, there's around about two thousand estates here. Average holdings are sort of between six to seven hectares. Um, a lot of the harvest is still like sold directly by the growers. And if you think about the big southern part of uh, the Beaujolais region, which is Nouveau, a lot of this is sold to co-ops. So there's about nine co-ops. There's about three or four of those within the crews themselves, the biggest being in Fleury. But a few of the other uh, crews do have a co-op. But a lot of the bigger co-ops sit in the south. And there's about 200-odd uh, negotiants as well. So, you know, it's quite well represented. If we sort of flick back to WSET and have a quick talk about the climate, you know, we're talking moderate, semi-continental. Um, and then if you look at the sort of the big, you know, the major features that influence the, the growing environment here, you've got the Eau Beaujolais, sort of the higher Beaujolais, which sort of goes up to seven or 800 metres. Um, uh, and the vineyards go up to sort of 400 plus uh, in, the, in one of the crews in particular. Um, and then on the other side, you have the Sone River, which has a bit of a moderating influence. And then you've got the very flat plains that run across all the way to the Alps. Um, there is there is decent sort of rainfall, but a lot of it occurs during sort of autumn and uh, autumn and winter. You have pretty pretty hot summers. You know, lots of uh, lots of canicules, as they call it, and heat waves in uh, in France. Um, we do get frost and we get hail. 
Um, a little bit like Burgundy does, you know, we're very close to that. And then there's a big impact of the Mistral winds. And I'll talk about that a little bit when we look at how the, um, you, you know, how the vines are actually grown. Um, and that's that typical sort of feature of the goblet vines here. Uh, if we look at production yields, so the AOC obviously is trying to make sure they, they have an, an impact on some of the quality. Um, and in the cruise, it's around 56 hectolitres per hectare. Whereas in the in the Beaujolais AOC and the Village, it's sort of around the sixty and fifty eight. But the reality is, is a lot of these a lot of these areas, the like either the vines are more spaced, but actually the uh, the actual the the real sort of harvest volumes are around sort of the forty one to forty four. So there's already that sort of reduced, um, you know, there's there's not this big focus on mass volume that there was sort of way back in the day. If we look at how the vines are, are planted, you've got this traditional sort of goblet vine that that basically is designed to, to protect the grapes from those mistral winds and those very hot summers. So you get more protection of the grapes. But what that really means is it's incredibly difficult to work because you can't mechanise any of that. And that makes it very, very hard. So more and more we're starting to see guillot pruning, um, and you know some of these chamay sort of caught on uh, training as well, and that is that's that's really happening in most of the replanting that's being done. And I think this year I've I've noticed around the region that there's the highest like there's there's been so many vines that have been pulled up, and there's a really big focus I think on replanting now, which I think is a really positive sign. I think you know a lot of the, a lot of these vineyards were incredibly old and probably not very productive and very efficient. And Vineron's a, you know, a, a rather than randomly sort of choosing a few different vines to to rip up, they're really focused on actually, you know what, let's take the pain for three or four years. Let's rip everything up, start again. We, we can hopefully sort of set up some mechanization to make it a little bit easier, but actually put some quality back in. So while they're resting these spaces, they're planting all sorts of, you know, different summer crops and planting winter crops and regenerating that soil and, you know, and, and really starting to, to, to try to, you know, to, to prepare the soils for, you know, for much better plantings going forwards. So there's some really good sort of positive, positive signs. Obviously, you know, Gamay is the king of Beaujolais and that's what we're here to talk about. It is a cross between Gouet Blanc and, uh, and Pinot Noir. So there's a lot of similar sort of characteristics that you do see in Pinot Noir. And the Gouet Blanc gives it, I think, some of those more sort of, you know, lighter red fruit and, uh, and some of those sort of uh, aromatics. Lots of different clones. So there's lots of detail. Everyone can go through this, uh, you know, at their own sort of pace afterwards. And if we just sort of look at the three different families of, uh, of wines here, this is how they sort of the region is broken up. So you've got Beaujolais, you know, which mostly goes into Nouveau. That is, it's not just Gamay. There's also Beaujolais Blanc, um, and there is some rosé. If you look at the village, it accounts for about twenty six percent of the uh, of the plantings uh, and the production. And then the crews account for about forty one percent. So they're the biggest of that group, um, which is uh, which shows the importance of uh, of those wines in the region. So there's two things I really want to focus on before we go into each of these individual crews. And the first one to really think about is these different winemaking styles here. So if we think about Beaujolais Nouveau, it's it's that traditional carbonic maceration that everyone talks about that, you know, that for want of better words, you know, the banana and bubble gum and everything you see, you know, the, the real characteristics of Nouveau that's, that's somewhat sort of branded the whole region. So that's basically where they take whole bunches, they um, put them into, into vats, they cover them in CO2, and then the vat itself is sealed off. And then within a few days, the, uh, the grape actually ferments internally, um, and then the grape split, and then that continuation goes on from there. Then the second potential style is more of a Burgundian style, and we do see this quite a bit up in the cruise. Um, where it's basically everything's destemmed and it's very normal red wine vinification, um, the way it's done there. And then the really popular system now is this semi-carbonic. So there will be some whole bunches placed in the bottom of the vats. And then uh, on top of that will be uh, crushed the, the crushed grapes. And as that fermentation happens, 
then you you still get these little little you know, little impact of the whole bunch internal fermentation, which gives a you know that really sort of unique character to it. But actually, you're really just focused on the you know the um, the the de-stemmed grapes, providing you with that you know that more intense color and that deeper, a little bit more tannin structure that comes from it. You know, the Gamay variety has actually got a higher tannin component than Pinot Noir, so. <clears throat> You, you know, it has the potential to be much more powerful and, and 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 have that sort of higher tannic structure. But the underlying fruit is just a little bit more gentle. So they have to be very, very careful with that. So it tends to be more pump over rather than punch down. Um, and they don't really want to be too aggressive with it because you can you can put things out of balance. The second big thing I want to talk about, and this is where I get really excited because this is where I just think, I think one, the research that's been done in the region is just extraordinary, but two, the different soil types are, are such a such a big component of what differentiates all of these different, particularly Cru Beaujolais uh, areas. So between 2019 and 18, the, uh, the the Beaujolais AOCs came together and they drilled. Yeah. It's actually something like twenty five thousand auger holes and pits to look at the different soil profiles around the whole region. And what they discovered was really really interesting. And the big thing they wanted to understand what understand was the you know the level of organic matter, the pH in the soils. Knowing all these characteristics of the soil helps them to sort of better better understand what what farming practices they need to the venerons need to do in the region and this is where i think it's really really important to, in understanding the crews is to really understand those different soil structures across the different crews and we'll, we're about to go into quite a bit of that detail the next thing i want to show you is just a uh, the the level of content within the um, Beaujolais.com, so the Onto Beaujolais website is just extraordinary. Uh, and they have some fantastic videos and like, you know, the, the English, you know, just about all the videos have got English subtitles on them. And the website itself is mostly, in, it has an English option on it. So it's there for all of us to use, you know, and for them to kind of promote, you know, everything about the region. So I really sort of encourage people to to do that. But you'll you'll see why in a little while. So I'm going to play a minute from a 22 minute video that they've produced just about the soils across the Beaujolais region. I'll play this for a minute. Then we'll have a bit of a look at it. Then we'll start looking through the crews themselves. Faire une étude à grande échelle, c'est un travail de fourmi. L'étude a permis de montrer qu'on avait beaucoup plus de variétés de sols que ce qu'on pensait, de variétés de roches également. La grande diversité des sols du Beaujolais, elle est liée bien sûr à la grande diversité des, des roches et à l'histoire géologique, euh, qui a été quand même relativement complexe. Donc effectivement, on arrive très bien à distinguer les personnalités entre les grandes appellations et entre les dix crues. Les dix crues ont tous leurs particularités. Quel est le lien entre le vin et le sol Le vin, le produit, il est bien à la face entre l'homme, le sol, le climat. Le sol, c'est un patrimoine auquel il faut veiller comme à la prunelle de ses yeux. Right, so you can see, like, there's some great video through that that really shows you the, uh, you know, it's a lot of the different soil types. And what we're really going to focus on is is two different sorts, um, is the pink granite soils, um, and then the blue schist soils, and they they occur across across a lot of the region. There are so many other different varieties as well, but these are the really two sort of dominant varieties, and I think these are the varieties that really drive. It's a lot about the different styles of uh, of the crew of the crew Beaujolais. So the ten crews, right? We're all we're all up here in the north part of it. The ten are all very close to each other, but there's this this incredible sort of interwoven series of hills. Uh, for those who haven't been to the region, it's extraordinary. And if you think about it from like you know your WSET aspect and 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 what you're looking for aspect and slope and and various you know various things like that 
the variation across these different across each different crew is really quite extraordinary so really knowing where your wines are coming from is also a really quite critical point in amongst the, the whole thing so I'll, I'll give you some tools to be able to go and have a look at where where the wines you're buying are from once you begin to understand what you like and what you're looking for in you know across Beaujolais it should be a little bit easier to go and identify the sort of wines that you want to buy um, or just go and buy them all and use them in different situations. And uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Right. So starting at the very bottom, we have the Brewery region. It's the biggest. It's 1,200 hectares. Um, here you've got a list of, uh, of some of the main sort of towns that are, that are around it and then the maximum sort of height. So... The, um, if we have a look at it here, we've got like 45% of the region is the, the pink granite. And then 35% is is some of these other, you know, there's there's either alluvial sort of river-based soils um, and, and a variety of other different uh, different soils in here. Um, and just to have a look, if you, if you can follow my pointer, I'm, I have a few interesting things to point out here. So... The colours really kind of match the soil type. So everywhere you see pink will be different types of pink granite. The deeper parts of it will be the more alluvial, very, very sort of soft, sandy soils. And then the lighter pink is much more rocky, but still that same sort of pink granite. You can see a few elements of blue, which is some of these little pockets of blue schist. But the interesting ones are some of these cream and, and sort of yellow coloured here. These are little pockets of calcareous rock, very, very similar to what you see up in sort of Chablis and, and, and most of Burgundy. Um, and interestingly, there's actually a number of the crew producers who have actually decided to plant Chardonnay on, uh, on some of these plots. So you're actually getting, you're putting Chardonnay grapes into, you know, the types of soil that, that really suit what they, uh, you know, what they, what they enjoy growing in and where they produce good quality. So those soil you know, examination and that and those and that all that soil testing has really you know paid dividends for the local vinerons to be able to chop and change what they are what they do. So that's brewery, it's the biggest. Then we move to Cote de Brewery, um, which is one of my more sort of favorite uh, favorite crews. Um, it's very famous for you can see some of the blue the blue stone, and we'll have a bit of a look at the uh, at the map a little bit uh, a little bit more there. It is quite small though, three hundred and ten hectares only gets up to about 300 metres high, um, but there's a higher, there's 42% of that region is uh, is this blue stone. And this gives you a better idea. So 484 metres at the centre on the top of Cote de Bury. There are a number of forests up here. And then we've got a lot of this blue stone and some of it's big, heavy blue stone. Some of it's more sort of broken down a little bit. And what this brings, look, you know, there's lots of there's lots of discussion in the world about whether you can taste the the soil type on wines, and we're not. I'm not really even necessarily talking about that. I think I think what happens is is that the gamay really performs very well because a lot of these vines are very low to the ground. When you have these warmer soils that stay warm overnight, you have this better ripening. And I think a little bit like you have with the you know the Galat Ronde in uh, in Chateau Neuf de Pape, that overnight heat stays within these grapes, but you get enough elevation to get that little bit of diurnal range that keeps that acidity there. And I think that the you know the Gamay really performs very very well for the bigger and more robust and the spicier sort of wines from these blue schist soils. But then on these other parts of brewery, you've still got uh, the Cote de Brewery, you've still got some of these pink granite soils. And this is all very west facing. So they're going to be cooler sites. They get afternoon sun, but they're not really getting morning sun. Whereas a lot of the blue stone here is really catching the big early and full days of sunlight. So you tend to get very, very, um, yeah, very, very, very ripe grapes from uh, from this part of the region. So when you're looking at Cote de Brie, you know, it's good to understand where, which part of the uh, the actual mountain it, uh, it comes from uh, as well. So then if we go to Renier, um, one of the slightly lesser known sort of appellations, but a lot of it's right next to Morgon. I mean, they're all right next to each other, but right next to Morgon. And you've got this one particular one, sorry, called Lantigny. 
And Lantignier is it's it's rumored to potentially become an eleventh crew. Um, I don't know how true that necessarily is, but the quality of wines coming from there is superb. But they're still branded as being Village, so you know your pricing on that is just is is exceptional. If you can find this uh, something from Lantignier. In the Premier, you've got a lot of big Morgon producers are there. The Guy Bretons of the world, uh, you know, are there. And the, and the Jean-Paul Fevenets and a lot of the Gang of Four, they've also recognised that there's some great soil types there. I, don't have, I, I haven't blown up every one of these big maps, but you can see there's a big, big percentage that is, uh, that is 63% that's this pink granite soils. 380 hectares, so it's actually a little bit bigger than, than Cote de Bury, and one of the, I think it's, that puts it sort of number five or six in the whole region. <clears throat> then if we get to Morgon, so this is the big sort of famous one that I think most people know really, really quite well. You can see, uh, so it's a bit over a thousand hectares, makes it number two to to brewery. Um, and if we look at this map a bit tighter, you've got this is this is this is one to really look at because you've got the you've got the Cote de P, which I think most people would probably know if you go to buy a Morgon. And what you're getting on this Cote de P is you're getting these blue schist soils again. This is a very gentle mount, goes up to about sort of three hundred and fifty meters. Um, you'll recognize often they have just there's a single big tree up on top of it. And if you stand on top of the Cote de P, you get baked in sunlight from the split second the sun pops up in the morning to when it sets in the afternoon. And you've got these blue schist and warmer soils. The soils up there, though, are a little bit more broken down and a little bit more nutrient content. So you've kind of got this really beautiful mix down there where you've got good production, the grapes can grow quite well, they're quite they're quite big and strong, they've got a little bit of nutrient, and you're just getting these incredible, incredibly ripe, uh, ripe grapes every year. It does mean it's very exposed when it comes to things like hail and, and various other things like the Mistral. So the Mistral wins just smash Cote de Brewery when they, uh, uh, Cote de Pee when, uh, when they come through. And then if you look at the rest of the Morgon area, it all goes back to being pink granite. And this is where it gets really interesting. So if you look at, if you, this is where really the focus on what the French call the Ludi or the Klima, um, a little bit like the Burgundian terms, these maps are absolutely fantastic. And they're all on the, the On de Beaujolais website. And you can start having a look at some of the more famous um, Ludites and understanding what you're going to get in those wines. So anything coming from Cote de P, you're going to get the bigger, deeper, richer, much more riper sort of wines. Then up here is a Ludite called Corselet. And a lot of places, a lot of venerants have got something up here in the Corselet. It's a really big Ludite. It's got a 428 metre, 438 metre uh, like highest elevation. Um, and again, it's getting lots of baked in sunlight, but the, the the pink granite is so low in nutrients that the vines just have to really, really struggle. So, you know, in a lot of these pink granite soils, old vines that are 40 or 50 years old are actually still really, really quite thin, like probably like not much thicker than, uh, than your wrist. And you'd expect that 40, 50-year-old vines would get a bit bigger and a bit more gnarly, a bit like if you look at them in Burgundy and, and particularly sort of New World. But these vines are really, really struggling. So something like the corselet is really important. Then uh, down here, down towards the bottom part of it, you have an area called the Grand Cra. Now, these sort of, sort of grey, olive-coloured um, soils down here are more alluvial sort of river soils. Um, it's very sandy, incredibly sandy, not really pink granite, not really with much a lot of colour in it. But what that tends to produce is a bit more floral um, and some really interesting wines coming from down there. So Grand Cra is certainly an area that's worth uh, worth keeping a bit of an eye on. So there are a couple. There's another one over here called Ocham, um, and that is quite uh, that produces some pretty great wines. It's also very very steep over there because it basically backs onto um, or it starts heading towards uh, the Frenier uh, side of side of things. So we move on and uh, we talk about Cherub. You can see from the map here it's all pink. Um, it's a hundred percent pink granite. 
but some incredibly steep sites here. And of quite a few of them are more than 400 metres high. Um, so up around here in this section, you can be at 430 here, about 500 up around here. And some of these vineyards are so steep. I mean, they take on the Mosul for, uh, for, you know, for how steep they are. So again, you've got this incredible aspect where they're just getting baked in direct sunlight. So you do get some beautiful ripe wines, but... They, because they're more than 400 metres high, they're getting this wonderful diurnal range and the acidity in them is so fresh and bright. So Sharub isn't seen all that often, but if you know where it, where within the Appalachian you are, because down here it's only about 250 metres. So up at the top, it's you know that's where you're getting you know that really great ripeness, but incredibly floral and you know really beautiful characters up there. So again, knowing where you are, is, uh, is really important. Then we move to Fleury. Again, we're 90% pink granite um, and a lot of undulation in the uh, in the in the, um, the the setup here. We also have at the top, we have the Lamadon Church, which you can see um, is the symbol of Fleury. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful region. And again, incredibly, some incredibly steep slopes. 450 metres up at the top where uh, Lamadon is. And a lot of these other sort of areas as well, it's really, really important to, to know the sort of soil types that, that you're in. But again, it's all very, very much pink uh, pink granite through through Fleury. So that's quite important. Moulin Avant is probably one of the better known. It's, I think, about number three from a size point of view. Um, a good mix of sort of pink granite um, and, and some very, very interesting vineyards there with some, you know, some really, really great producers. A lot of the Burgundian producers are, have taken footholds in uh, actually in Moulin Avant. Um, so, you know, that's a really positive indication of, of the whole region that Burgundy, you know, is starting to move south. But you can see that there are some of these more alluvial sort of soils down and across in the in the lower sections of it, but again, lots of uh, lots of lots of pink uh, pink granite in this sort of region. If we go across to Shanus, it's it, look, it's not one of the best known, um, but there's some absolutely super wines that come from it. Um, but again, it's it's the smallest of the lot at about two twenty seven. Um, again, lots of pink granite. There's some great elevation here, and actually quite a few really good vineyards that are that are facing sort of north northeast. Um, so with with you know climate change coming, you know there's some really interesting opportunities and uh, and some really great growers there. Um, and again, these lower plains are more this alluvial sandy soil, bringing a bit more floral sort of character. And then up on the slopes where there's a bit more sun, you're getting a slightly more riper sort of setup. Juliana, so which is straight out my window here. Uh, I live right on the border of Juliana and uh, actually live right about here. Um, a much higher concentration here of this blue stone, and I've got the larger map for us here. So this whole section up here is actually, uh, um, it's called uh, Mont, Mont Bessé, 478 metres at the top. So it's getting up there with, with Sharub and some very, very steep slopes. But just these interesting pockets of, you know, like, you know, blue schist in, in sort of, you know, um, broken down and also some larger blue schist up there. But then it's got some of these alluvial soils down the bottom and just this incredible mosaic um, within it. So understanding that is, is again, where your wines are coming from are really, really important. But if you if you buy wines from Cote de Besse up in this area here, you're going to be getting some really big, ripe, very sort of Morgon Cote de P and, and Cote de Brewery style sort of wines. Then Santa Mor, where, uh, where I live. Um, and, and again, this incredible mosaic of soils here where up around sort of the highest part, you've got, um, you've got blue schist up in this area more sort of pink granite, a little bit more blue schist. But very interestingly, right on this section here where you can see my pointer, this turns into, this is basically the border of the Maconnais in Burgundy. And the soils have already changed into absolutely Burgundian soil at this point in time. So a lot of producers are putting some putting Chardonnay in here. But also, it's doing some really interesting things with uh, with Gamay. You're getting you know you're getting more nutrient content. The vines are you know are bigger, a bit more robust. Um, but you you've really got these big soil sort of soil type changes. So again, there's some really fascinating stuff around 
you know, around where your wines are coming from and the opportunity to, to go in and have a look at these maps. Maps. So yeah, I encourage you to to do that. As you sort of, if you're if you're keen to keep taking the journey that is, you know, that is the crew Beaujolais. The beautiful part of it is that you you can have a lot of fun with it. You can work out the sort of wines you want, work out what you can order from your various either shops or online, and get a real sense of you know of wherever these ludites are. Just working out exactly the soil types within them to understand the sort of resulting wine that you're going to get um, at the back end of it, which will which will help you enjoy the experience a bit more. So that's it for the cruise. I have moved very quickly. Everyone will have access to this presentation. You can go back and look at it. But I really do encourage everyone to, to come in and have a, uh, you know, go on to Beaujolais.com and have a look around and, you know, and sort of continue on with, uh, with everything they've done. So now if we sort of look at the region and some of the, the bigger sort of developments and, and where it's headed. Um, so there's some interesting statistics here. Half of the growers of the Beaujolais will retire within 10 years. So you have this new generation that's coming through. And what this new generation is doing, it's bringing with it, you know, people who've, you know, the, the, the younger generation, the, you know, the sons and the daughters are continuing on, but they're saying, hey, you know, mum and dad, we're actually going to do things a bit differently. We're going to start heading towards being a bit more organic. We're going to take a bit more care. You know, we're going to reduce our yields a little bit. We're going to just, you know, we're going to, we're going to move to a semi-carbonic maceration and try to produce some slightly bigger sort of wines. And for the most part, they're winning that battle. But there's a number that aren't. So, you know, that sort of is making it quite fun. There's new generations excited about doing things. The new generation are the ones who want to rip up the old unproductive vineyards, you know, and start treating the, you know, treating the the, the land with a bit of respect and and putting, you know, putting great, you know, great new vineyards in and, and really sort of, you know, setting up the next generation that they will bring to the plate. You've got different winemakers coming to the region. As I mentioned, you've got Burgundy. You've got a lot of Burgundy producers that have taken some parcels down here. But you've also got people moving in from different parts of France who also see the opportunity here in, uh, you know, in Beaujolais for, uh, you know, for, for the opportunity to, to come in and do something a little bit different. You know, there's a there's a wonderful vineyard just up in Chenis that, uh, you know, the couple, they come from Alsace. You know, they've been excited about coming to this region, you know, and, and people are starting to do that and starting to build their domains here. So I think that's that that speaks volumes for the for the future of the industry. And it's bringing more, it's been bring better practices and it's bringing highly motivated people to, you know, to the region who really want people to understand it. So, you know, if you ever get to visit the region, Veterans are incredibly, incredibly willing to, to you know, to spend time with you. And, you know, a one hour, you think something will be a one hour appointment and you'll be there for three hours and all of a sudden they've opened 20 wines. And I mean, it's just an absolutely wonderful experience. So I highly encourage you to come to the region because there's great people doing some really, really fantastic things here. So if we look back at, and I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of focus on, you know, on organic and and biodynamic and uh, and 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 that that part, which I think is absolutely brilliant and it really needs to be done. Um, and it's 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 really genuine. You don't, you know, I think that whole biodynamic and and um, farming, if people use it aggressively as being a you know, this is how we do, you know, this is how we produce wines and and they use that as their marketing component then I think they're doing it just for the marketing. But I think for a lot of a lot of producers now, they're doing it because they actually fundamentally believe in it. You know, you had the Gang of Four, which is Marcel Lapierre, uh, Guy Breton, Jean Foyard, uh, and Jean-Paul Tavernet. They really drove the, you know, the, the um, bio biodynamic, you know, industry in France from here in Beaujolais. Yeah, and that's really continued on, and it's really a big cultural impact here. So, you know, they're doing some really, really fantastic things with that in the region, and I think that's that's starting to result through in uh, you know in really good, high quality wines as well. The next stage is moving towards the Premier Cruz. So, the AOC of Fleury have already submitted their uh, their application for uh, for Premier Cru, and others are along the uh, are on the way. Now, bear in mind that the Puy Fuise uh, appellation 
took about 12, 15 years from when they first applied to it actually getting through. So this is not something that's going to happen quickly um, because of the nature of kind of where we are and, and the admin and, and obviously the, the technicalities of doing it. But again, it's showing some positive signs to, to moving towards this sort of premier cruise status and even within the cruise themselves. Um, and I think that'll be really interesting to see how that sort of, you know, uh, evolves. Um, it's going to be a long time coming, but but we'll get there. We'll get there in the end, I'm sure. Talking about climate change, um, you know, I think the, you know, there's a there's a, a lot of things that are being done, you know, in the, in the region. There is a very, very large experimental vineyard um, in, in a couple of different parts of, uh, of Beaujolais where they're looking at, you know, the different impacts of different grape varieties um, and, and looking at different clones, different sort of structures around having to deal with the fact that, you know, we are seeing, you know, elevated temperatures um, and more random sort of temperatures. They're looking at the potential for something like anti-hail nets taking technology from places like, uh, you know, places like Argentina that are quite big, looking at different ways of pruning, different ways of, of planting, different clones. Um, so there's a lot of work being done in the background to try to give vinerons the tools to be able to really, you know, to really produce their best wines. And I really think those things are actually starting to starting to happen very well. So they're, you know, they're really exciting sort of changes. The challenges. So we had to talk about it at some point, the debuff factor. I mean, the reality is, is the guy was an absolute marketing genius. What he created has basically meant that the region has been tagged forever. And there's an annual reminder on the third Thursday of every, uh, of every November as Beaujolais Nouveau starts again. And I think that provides a big challenge and it weighs quite heavily on the crew producers. Um, but the fact is, any marketing is good marketing, really, you know, and particularly in this sort of case. So I think what what I say to people is that they really just need to, they need to bracket Beaujolais into its different styles. So Beaujolais Nouveau has its place, right? It's it's meant to be light and easy, drink with a bit of charcuterie, have it with some friends, don't overanalyze it, chill it. You know, treat it as just a slightly more, you know, more interesting rosé is kind of how I how I think about it, right? Don't have massive expectations. It's also not very expensive. So you need to be a little bit fair and fair to, to the value proposition that comes from it as well. Um, you know, a lot of the crew producers, they still very privately, you know, have their nouveau because there is a market for it. And the whole thing that came about was that, you know, after the war, the you know the the region, you know, the veterans to survive needed to get cash in the door, and this was the best way to do it. So, you know, there there is this, you know, there's this big stigma that that arrives with it, and it is really quite challenging, and it continues to be a major challenge for them all. I mean, so much so that most of the crew producers don't even put Beaujolais on their labels. You know, and you can offer, you know, and a lot of them talk about, they, they hear consumers come into a brasserie in Paris and, you know, and the waiter will say, oh, you know, they suggest a Beaujolais. It's like, oh, no, I don't want to drink Beaujolais. And then they say, oh, well, we have a brewery. And they go, oh, yes, I'll have a brewery. Or I'll have a Morgan. You know, the consumer actually doesn't really quite understand, you know, the crew level of it. And that's sort of where we, you know, where, where, where us as consumers need to sort of understand that and move on from there. Um, as I said, Onto Beaujolais have been massively supportive. They've created incredibly high content to help uh, to help everybody uh, understand it. And they even have separate teams for sort of Nouveau and Village and for the crews as well. So they sort of, even they separate it out. Right, so this is going to make everyone a bit hungry. And I sort of make no apology, but one of the things I do love doing, having uh, having studied a lot about uh, about food as well and, and done various courses, plus living in Asia, um, I think the food pairing for for the crew Beaujolais is just great fun. You're like, I use a Coravan and, and various times I'll take three or four different crews at a time and pet and try matching them up with uh, with different sort of foods. So these are some of the things that I've sort of come to. And again, it depends exactly what sort of style you really like in your uh, you know in your Beaujolais. But uh, but let's get everyone a little bit hungry. Right. So if we think about over here, we think about the more floral and sort of red fruit um, character styles of wine. So often you get that from Fleury. Cherub, something more. 
where you've got sort of violets and peonies and a little bit of rose and you've got these bright sort of red fruit characters. They can actually be a fantastic match for things like roasted salmon um, and even even other sort of richer like cod dishes and, and things like that. Mushroom risotto is just absolutely delightful because it's neither is overpowering each other and they're just bringing this lovely little compliment, uh, compliment to each other. Um, you know, to throw something out there, Try one of those with a with a chicken tikka, and you, you'll just be absolutely blown away. The the floral elements of the of of those sort of styles of wines with the really aromatic and kind of creamy and rich chicken tikka is is just a it's just an absolutely superb combination. And the beauty of Beaujolais, given that that the tannins are usually fairly sort of low to you know to medium minus, um, is that Tannin and chili are not friends. So often red wines get get either excluded from spicy uh, food or just everyone just gravitates towards something with some residual sweetness and goes, this is what you do. But actually, you know, those lower tannin red wines like Beaujolais are really fantastic for, uh, for spicier foods. So don't be afraid to use them in, uh, you know, and, and, and to serve them with some of these, uh, with some of those sort of dishes. Pig and duck pancakes, you know, aromatic sort of, you know, roasted crispy duck and oh, superb um, Thai fish cakes. You know, with a little bit of spice in them, and you know, and uh, and the way they're sort of you know deep fried again. That that acidity can cut through the fat um, of both the, the duck and the uh, and the you know, and Thai fish cakes. Then if we move into the sort of the, the the middle middle section with kind of the red and black fruit and slightly more mineral Beaujolais that has a little bit of an element of spice in it. So you're talking about Brewy, Juliana. Uh, Moulin Avant, Renier, and uh, and Morgon, but maybe not the Morgon Cote de Pie side. Then you know roast chicken's fabulous, and why not throw in some duck fat potatoes? Because you know everyone decides that that is uh, that's good, and the acidity is there to help you cut through it. Things like kind of wild boar ragu, and you know, and some gamey sort of characters are really nice with that because you get that little bit of spice, but not too much. And things don't overpower. Um, if you want to stick to French, you can go cassoulet. Um, again, you've got that acidity that really helps kind of cut through the fatty fattiness and the heaviness of something like cassoulet. Um, Thai red duck curry, beautiful aromatics, and you know, and a little bit of you know, a little bit of spice coming through um, is great. And something like a sizzling Mongolian lamb or something uh, something heavier in the in the Chinese sort of category, Chinese food category is great fun as well. And then if we move across into sort of the, the bigger, heavier wines, the Cote de Bruyne's and the Morgan Cote de Pies and some parts of sort of Chenard and then Juliana Cote de Besse, you're getting really rich, dark fruit and spice, um, baking spices and a bit of smoke. So things like bar barbecue and braised beef rib, bourguignon, you know, slow, slow smoked uh, pork ribs. And then into your heavier curries like a lamb madras, um, and something that you know that really can be quite uh, quite good fun is like a beef and holy basil type sort of stir fry. Um, that again, these bigger, richer components, elevated you know the chili spice, but actually you know the lower tannins means that you can uh, you can handle through some of that. So, but again, experiment. Everyone's palate's different. These are things that I've sort of found are uh, really great fun to to, uh, to pair with uh, with Cru Beaujolais. Um, and you know, Beaujolais and Charcuterie are just a fabulous marriage made in heaven. I was I was invited by to Beaujolais to host um, uh, the Guardian um, uh, wine journalists, and we looked at some of the crew crew Beaujolais. Well, it was mostly brewery and Cote de Brewery up against a variety of uh, of different charcuteries from the region. And it's interesting because not everything worked with everything. So everyone's palates are going to be a little bit uh, a little bit different on that. And that was with Fiona Beckett from The Guardian. So, um, you know, there's something a little bit online from uh, from her as well. And that is it for me. We're bang on about 13, 14 minutes to go. Um, and I'll stop sharing the screen now and maybe we throw back to... Uh, to question time, and if people have got wines out to uh, to sample, I've got a couple here, and uh, and we can roll to that. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Cameron. Yeah, you've you've stimulated everybody. A lot of questions. A few questions have come through. Um, we'll just try and run through those. Patricia Stevanovich. Patricia, do you want to ask your questions? There's a couple of that you've made. A couple of questions and observations. Um, I'm can't remember what I said because ah. my chat has gone all the way down to about number 
35 or some silly number. Okay. Could you just read it out if you can see it, Andrea, yeah. please? I can, uh, I can see it, actually. Uh, Should Beaujolais be considered part of Bourgogne? Yeah, look, I think from time to time it actually is, but only when it suits Burgundy. Um, so, look, I don't know. I, look, I think it can stand on its own two feet, to be fair. Um, you know, I think, it, it, you know, it's it's trying to get out from underneath this veil of being Beaujolais Nouveau is is all that Beaujolais is about. Then if it gets kind of trapped underneath, you know, the big, you know, the big dominant brother in, in Burgundy, then that I think that gives it a bit of an, an ongoing identity crisis. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think they desperately want that to be the case, to be honest. Thanks, um, Cameron. That's really quite interesting because because it's north of Lyon and it makes it difficult to try to fit it anywhere. And, of course, you can see it from the Lycée or from the Hawk in the southern part of Maconnet anyway. Watch the Slutra, um, yeah. Well, exactly. Or Vergison. Yeah. But I, it's, it's a curiosity in the sense that in some ways... I kind of like to link it because, of course, at one stage, Gamay was grown throughout all of Bourgogne as well. It was. Even it if was. now it is not. No, that's exactly so, right. But I take your point, and maybe Beaujolais would like to make itself something different. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's look, and look, that's absolutely my personal opinion. I mean, you know, this this is just this is just what I think. If I was a, if I if I was a producer here, I'd be wary of, of desperately wanting to be part of you know of part of Burgundy. I think they're very very happy with kind of where they where they stand. Um, but again, that's not everybody. So fair enough. Thank you. Okay, there's another. And Trevor Shaw asked the question: Is there? Do you have any guidance on bottle aging, Cameron? Yeah, so I think across the cruise, there's definitely quite a few producers who are definitely making their wines to be um, more suitable for aging, particularly where you get some of the bigger, more more structured uh, wines. There's a lot of wines that are being put in, um, you know, either large oak barrels or uh, or smaller oak barrels. Um, but older barrels, not so much for the oak impact, but very much for that uh, that micro oxygenation that enables wines to be you know to be stored for a little bit longer. But definitely, they've got the structure and the and the complexity to be able to to definitely age. Um, you know, I've had I've had some back into the nineties, and it's interesting. After about ten years, they really start showing as very very Burgundian in style. So it gets quite exciting. So if you can find them on auction sites or things like that. I really encourage you to try to find um, some some older Beaujolais because it's really quite a, it's quite it's great fun to uh, to do it and it's even better to try to trick people on what they think it is because there's a fair chance that they'll say oh this is something Burgundy which I think every Beaujolais producer would be very excited to hear. Well, that's exactly what I was doing. I bought some bottles at auction, <clears throat> excuse me, a few years ago, and um, at ten to twelve years old, they were fantastic. Um, yeah. Chateau de Jacques and Merlin, for example. Exactly. No, Trevor, you're absolutely spot on. So yeah, they're definitely worth trying to uh, to, to seek out. Thank you. Uh, the other question was from Liz. Liz, do you want to unmute or? Yes, thank you. Um, Cameron, I'd like to know a little more about how temperatures are changing in Beaujolais, and um, particularly given that it is high and very sort of hilly, it's not um, a not consistent area. And is Gamay particularly susceptible to temperature rises? Um, because you said birds are looking at uh, alternative grapes as a possibility, because that would be an enormous change in Beaujolais if uh, Gamay was uh, at least partially replaced by any other variety. Yeah, the um, I'm not sure of the exact statistics on on exactly what the the raised temperatures are you know are, are, are coming to at the moment. I think they're probably very linked to what they're talking about in Burgundy. I think here you've got you've got enough pockets where you've you can you can have vineyards that actually have slightly reduced sun exposure. Um, Gamma is a little bit susceptible to sunburn, and this is part of the reason why. There's this goblet, the goblet vinification, uh, the goblet um, uh, uh, pruning method, in that it leaves a lot of leaf structure 
to keep the grapes shaded and they're that little bit lower to the ground. So it's very much designed around that. There's Gamay will always still be the main grape here, but some people are hedging their bets a little bit. And when they're finding terroir that's a bit more suitable to other varieties. So there are a number of plantings of Syrah around. Um, and one in particular, Chateau de Jacques actually has a few uh, has a few plantings of, uh, of Syrah. And they make an absolutely stunning Syrah, but it's being made here and it's IGP. So it's, you know, it'll never be able to be sort of, you know, to be very expensive. So I think they're more being a little bit smart than necessarily trying to trying to sort of replace Gamay as the as the main grape. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other. There's lots of people thanking you, uh, Cameron, for the great presentation. People wanting um, a copy of the presentation, and what I'll probably do is email it to everybody that's attended today, if that's okay with you. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. And it will also go on our the, the members' uh, pages of our website. And obviously, people who've here, been here, we have recorded the session, so it will be available on our YouTube channel um, to view at a later date, if you wish. I'm not sure if there's any other questions um, from the floor. Otherwise, I'll hand over to Winnie. Oh, I think Winnie's on mute. No, ah, there she is. I was very stern to say that was very, very wonderful. Thank you very much. Oh, Absolutely very fabulous. I, I came here this afternoon just to refresh my memory. And what I knew was not even remotely what you taught me this afternoon. So <laughs> thank you very, very much for that. Um, of course, now I'm hungry and thirsty and I have no Beaujolais because we do not have it in South Africa. Ah, so very true. Have, so, you, so you'll have to come over here to... Um, um, congratulate me on the World Cup rugby win and bring some version <laughs> with you. Well, Winnie, look, there was no need to get nasty and talk about rugby. Like, <laughs> clearly, I'm Australian and it has been a very, very difficult last three or four weeks. So, uh, so there we go. So, perhaps I'll have to come and you can buy me the uh, you can buy I, me the, uh, the Beaujolais. I shall, buy, I shall buy you the dinner, but you bringing the Beaujolais. Okay, uh, but absolutely fabulous. Thank you very much. And I think this has been one of the most informative talks we've had it's also one of the talks we've had the most attendance so you're obviously famous um not sure and, about uh, that but I, <laughs> but i really i really love those maps and i will definitely go back on the website because i think that was very very informative for us just to see where everything is and why the wines are what they are so yeah. thank you very much for all your for all your um putting it all together and um i look forward to the the link andrea yeah Fantastic. Yeah. And and from my perspective, look, thank you for everyone for for logging in. You know, it's wonderful to see people, you know, who, who are interested, who want to learn more about it. You know, we've got so many great passionate producers and 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 a huge thanks to on to Beaujolais. You know, they they give me a lot of these, uh, a lot of this content for me to be able to uh, to present on. Um, you know, and uh, they sort of give me the keys to the uh, keys to the cabinet. So that's been very kind of them as well. But as I said, their uh, their investment in their in their website and their content is just uh, just extraordinary. So uh, uh, could please continue to keep drinking Beaujolais, seek it out, see what you can find, and uh, and enjoy.